Hi everybody, it's me, Ghost Critic, and if you're watching this on a Friday, it does mean I managed to read all my comic books because, whoo, it was a stack and a half this week. Um, so right off the bat, I will say this is probably going to be another of those long videos, so I apologise straight away. Um, let's kick off straight away with a book that has been out for weeks and weeks and weeks. Finally, I've got my copy, um, but I just wanted to throw my thoughts in. They're not going to be any different than anyone else has said about this book. But yes, I finally got my issue of Frankenstein alive, alive, issue three. Yes, we've waited ah, so long for this, but there is no way anyone can complain due to the awesome high quality of this book. Um, it's Bernie Wrightson, you know, everyone talks about the artwork when they talk about this title, and with good reason. There's there's a reason why he is esteemed so highly uh, amongst comic book creators, because this book is just soaked in detail. Uh, and it's just amazing to look at. The painstaking detail that is in here is just a sight to behold. If you're any fan of comic books um, at all, then this kind of book is what you should be picking up. Forget about all the ridiculous Marvel and DC events that they churn out over and over again. It's very rare that you find a book like this that is just it's a wonder. It's the eighth wonder of the world. Um, it's just the detail. I always say detail. It's the detail from like every blade of grass, from every kind of skull, skeleton, piece of lab equipment, slate on a roof, rain coming down from the sky, hair coming down someone's face. It is just so perfect that you just can't deny how good this book is. Um, and while it is really great, it's kind of unfair that Steve Niles' writing is very much being overlooked here. Uh, everyone always talks about the artwork. Um, but Steve Niles is writing a very kind of um, emotional book on, on behalf of Frankenstein's monster here. Uh, it's not often that you see the monster uh, talking this eloquently with such gentleness. And this is very much the crux of this particular issue, where we have Frankenstein's monster struggling with his identity uh, of the monster. Um, death, we know, always follows the monster. Um, obviously, most of it, if, uh, or a lot of it, is by his own hands. But you see this softness, this gentleness um, of, of this monster. And it's just... Oh, it's good. And I... That's faint praise. It's marvellous. It's fantastic. Superlatives, superlatives, superlatives. Go and find this. Go and pick up the um, last two issues. First printings, second printings, whatever. You just should have copies of this in your collection. And from one incarnation of Frankenstein's monster to another, and again by Steve Niles. Steve Niles loves the monster. Um, it's the third part of IDW's Monster and Madman um, kind of mini series. And this one, it was a strange old deal. Um, it's had this kind of subtitle at the bottom, The Secret History of Jack the Ripper and Frankenstein's Monster. Um, I really think this title could have done with being at least another three issues long because what was this secret history between them apart from this kind of chance meeting that didn't really develop between them um, with uh, kind of Jack the Ripper off killing um, you know young prostitutes um, to gain parts to give 
Frankenstein's monster uh, a mate so he wouldn't be lonely. We always have this idea and this concept that Frankenstein's monster must always be alone and when he does get himself a partner or a friend tragedy strikes and obviously in this issue it does as well. But there just seem to be very little kind of story content and it did this was one of the times where this kind of title needed stretching out it needed a few more issues to develop not only the relationship between the two characters but themselves individually we see very little of kind of Jack the Ripper outside of his kind of laboratory his home how he lures the women in uh, which would have been interesting to watch. Um, but it's done now, it's gone. The artwork, um, I've said before, it's very dark, it's very moody. It kind of gives you the whole Victorian London feel. Um, but um, as a whole, not really much to it. Batwoman, issue 31. Oh, good Lord. Look, I'm reading these bad comics so you don't have to. <sighs> Seriously, I don't know what is wrong with this writer. I really should do some research to find out what he's written in the past and if he has always been this appalling. Um, we have the end of this awful um, kind of treasure hunt storyline with um, Spider-Wolf, um, this old codger that is trying to find and steal all these paintings um, to get clues to find out where the, this treasure is hidden. Um, but it all seems so inconsequential and what, they were looking for a box of gold coins. Um, ones that in the end would have been unsellable and this guy who had got the spider wolf to go out and try and you know collect all these paintings to get all the clues put together he was obviously a very rich guy to start with and I know there's the whole kind of um, cliche that the rich always want to be richer um, but this just seemed just a tad unoriginal, completely unoriginal. And if we didn't already know who our kind of spider wolf alias was um, from a couple of issues ago where they kind of bumped into each other in their civilian outfits, then he hit us over the head once again with a big old brick and told us again who it most definitely was. I do feel like crying, but stubborn till the end, I'm going to keep getting it. I don't want this title to be cancelled. Green Hornet issue 12, the penultimate issue. Uh, while issue 12 does wrap up this current storyline, we have one more issue to go due to the kind of revelation, I guess, of what happened at the end of this title. Um, there isn't ever really much I can say about Green Hornet because it is a very kind of straightforward kind of cops and mob storyline. Um, and it, it kind of goes the way that we're seeing in Batman Eternal where there are a lot of bad cops um, who are doing all these bad dealings and stuff and... Um, protection rackets and the like but there's never really a great amount of kind of twists and turns with this title and that may be why it's finishing now um, in the next issue with issue 13 but um, it has been you know a, a solidish title it's entertained me and kind of brought me into the world of Green Hornet, which I'd never read before. I had fun with it. It means I've got one less comic to pick up now, and I might be looking at something else to buy. Um, but serviceable. The artwork was nice. The writing was adequate for Mark Wade. There was just something special about this book. 
Mind the Gap, issue 17, it returns after its hiatus. To be honest, I'd almost forgotten about this title. And it didn't really help that I should maybe have read a couple of issues, um, the kind of back issues of this, to get me back up to speed to exactly what had been happening. Um, though, you know, reading this just as it was, you were kind of up to speed. Um, it's we got Ellie back out of her coma, though for how much longer? Given she's part of this Jarius um, project, she's been kidnapped by someone we didn't even know about. There are there is another interested party in poor Ellie, um, and so it, this basically is an issue of her kind of recovering out of her coma, um, wondering whether she should trust um, her new kidnapper, though they do apparently have a lot of connections to each other. Um, everyone else is out looking for Ellie, um, and Mother Dearest has known about another party, it seems, for quite some time, and makes um, an appearance that isn't very welcome. Um, I said I think I need to go back and read a few past issues of Mind the Gap to um, remind me of, of where we are, what we're at and whether I need to be continuing with this title given that really I'd almost forgotten about it. Okay we move on to Batman Eternal issue 7 our weekly look at this huge year-long event from Scott Snyder and James Tinian. And we're back in full action form with a diversionary tactic uh, created by Falcone and his cohorts blowing up one of Professor Pig's warehouses that Batman just happens to be um, close by, um, to be distracted, getting rid of all the um, kind of Dollatrons created by Professor Pig, um, but Falcone's real target in this issue is, as you can see on the cover, the Penguin's Iceberg Casino, and with the help of um, Killer Shark, a big white whale, and of course lots of bombs, he does uh, sink that iceberg. Um, it's the interesting part I felt with this um, issue was the conversation between Catwoman and the Penguin. Yes, Catwoman shows up in this issue um, and Penguin kind of berates her for being one of those kind of fence sitters. She's not taking a side um, either way in this ongoing recently started war between the old school Falcone mob and our kind of new freaks um, as Falcone calls them of you know Penguin and herself Catwoman alike and it just kind of raises this question um, which of the two is a lesser evil um, the Penguin kind of quite puts it quite well that, um, you know, he has organised all these gangs to come together, he's kept all the violence off the street, but what Falcone actually wants to do is really bring that all back, and what happens is that innocent people will die. So you kind of get where the Penguin's coming from, and um, are almost siding with him in, uh, in a way. Um, the only bit I really couldn't stomach about this issue was Commissioner Forbes releasing um, Professor Pig towards the end. Yes, it it had to happen so the end of this issue could could transpire. But given that uh, Commissioner Forbes is working for Falcone and Falcone is all about getting these kind of freaks off the street and bringing back his old traditional uh, kind of mob mentality um, to allow Forbes to just release him regardless of how he was captured yes there's the whole point that Forbes makes we don't deal with capes but this just seems to be pardon the pun pig-headed 
um, beyond belief um, to just then let him go because that's a freak that Falcone doesn't want on his streets. Um, apart from that little niggle there, I mean it lasted a few panels but still it kind of annoyed me that that happened. Um, another great issue with Batman Eternal. Um, plenty of action um, and more characterization for some of the main characters of our Bat universe. The Unwritten Apocalypse, issue five. Um, great issue. Uh, as I expected, uh, the cover was a dead giveaway. This is a Paulie Bruckner centered story. And it is basically the story of from when he kind of ascended from um, and not so much escaped, but left Hades uh, and entered into our kind of crazy screwed up London. Um, all the way through this is very violent, visceral, there's sexual elements to this book. Um, it's foul mouthed as always whenever you have Paulie Bruckner there. Um, but as Wilson says as he leaves Paulie Bruckner kind of unconscious on the floor, um, Mr Bruckner is a survivor and we see in this title how he survives this crazy new London that we've been seeing in the last four issues. Um, and throughout this title we do get an insight into kind of what has happened to London, um, the new rules that have been made, um, kind of ever-changing landscapes, uh, and the way that Paulie, while he is quite a, an unpleasant character, there are moments when he does try to do good, but unfortunately that still leads to tragedy. Um, you get him uh, quite, I guess, uncharacteristically because all the time he was in Willowbank he always wanted to leave it but now he yearns for that simple life, that kind of quaint Beatrix Potter land where everyone was nice to each other However horrible Paulie Bruckner was at Willowbank, um, all the animals still forgave him, uh, you know, kind of gave him big hugs and liked him and loved him. Um, so it's come to this point now that Paulie Bruckner wants to go back to Willowbank. Um, and he starts... I, it would appear that he starts kind of hallucinating, um, imagining the animals of Willowbank in his kind of crazy, screwed up London um, environment. And specifically, it's Mr. Wu, the wisest owl. And in a very clever piece of uh, storytelling, we see a kind of a scene that we did see in the last issue, a conversation between Tommy and Paulie in the house, but from Paulie's perspective. And the voice of Mr. Wu talking to him that obviously Tommy couldn't see uh, adds this extra element and kind of twisted um, storytelling which was just you didn't see this coming and then you find out who Mr Wu really is and you just think oh poorly what have you done brilliant book um, I've loved the unwritten in the first volume. This last volume, this 12 part series where um, Mike Carey and Peter Gross are wrapping everything up has just been equally as interesting, intriguing and fun. Um, go find the trades. By the time you've read the trades, probably finished and you can pick up the trade for this instead. So, Saga Issue 19 came out this week and this is the issue that everyone's been waiting for to come back and to be honest I'm not so sure why. We were kind of promised this bold new direction for this book and maybe it is yet to come but this issue just seemed to kind of tread the same ground, the same format that it has done for issue after issue after issue. 
uh, to like the beginning first splash page which is always something crazy and effed up um, in this case it's a very graphic um, scene of the princess robot giving birth to um, a, the baby robot um, uh, in all its kind of womb blood which happens to be blue um, goriness and right to the very end where you have the <gasps> shock horror cliffhanger. It's all very similar now. This is what we get with every issue. Um, in the middle, you know, I thought, especially from this cover, because I didn't know who this was, I thought this was a brand new um, character, uh, hence the bold new direction. But no, this is Alana. She's got herself a job on this kind of virtual reality TV program. It's kind of like a, a superhero space opera. She's not very good at it, but clearly this is the job she has to do. Marco's being the kind of stay-at-home dad, looking after the kid. Uh, they are kind of meant to be hiding, though, as it said in this issue, no one seems to be trying to find them very hard. Um, hence Marco can take out his kid and have her play out on a bouncy castle um, all afternoon to tire her out. And it's all very sweet, it's all very cute. Um, but it, again, it's just a, a bit of a family dynamic story. Um, what I will say um, about this book, which is a big, a big plus for me, I have to say, but Fiona Staples are working here it seemed very fresh and bright and colourful, which is very much a change from, um, you know, all the last issues. Maybe this is just um, because of where they are on this planet called, um, I think it was Gardenia, um, and it's kind of, it's kind of bright, colourful, safe-ish type of environment. Um, but to me, this was just kind of, same old, same old. It's still good. I don't, it's not bad in any way. It's just, we've seen all this already. Um, for those people who were kind of shocked, horror, and oh my God, what a cliffhanger. Um, really, uh, Brian K. Vaughan has faked us out so many times. And when he uses the word split, I don't think he probably means it in this the literal term yes i think some some people are going to part ways to probably have their own storylines adventures but i don't think they're splitting for good cryptic let's finish this week off with the amazing east of west issue 12 wow this was Good. <laughs> um, last issue, we were introduced or even reintroduced to all our participants for this kind of nation summit um, to discuss, well, there's only one thing to discuss and that is war and whether they should all go to war or not. Uh, we have um, kicking it all off um, the House of Mao. It's um, Zaolian, I think her name is, um, putting her point across, roiling people's backs up. Um, and the characterizations in these uh, in this summit uh, by obviously both by Hickman and um, the wonderful artwork of Dragotta. Uh, every single character is different, has their own quirks. Um, the, you know their own characteristics uh, and so beautifully realized they all obviously have their own agendas um, while some are quite happy to keep this kind of fake peace others are seriously pushing for a war and while you know some people aren't taking the chances that we will keep this peace and have set certain um, 
uh, things in motion to ensure that whatever happens, whatever the outcome, um, and if it does go against them, there will still be a war. And this is certainly what happens in here. I love this kind of group called The Nation, um, which uh, seem to be kind of highly revered by uh, many of these participants of the summit. Um, they're kind of like this kind of higher ethereal beings um, that uh, kind of, they look kind of part human, part machine, uh, kind of very godlike looking and they have kind of the ability to um, predict outcomes if such and such happens then this will then this will or a certain percentage of this will uh, and in great kind of I don't know, kind of detective, whodunit style, just as one of these are kind of going to go and, you know, reveal that something is not right, that there are lies and deception at this table. What happens? They are put out the picture. Um, there's a big bomb, there's gunfire, there's blood and guts all over the table by the end of this issue. It's just so well written and I'm sorry it just I've never really liked Hickman's writing but he is on point with this book it is there's apart from obviously the kind of big explosion and kind of the gunfire this is a very talky talky issue there is a lot of dialogue in here uh, but so needed so worth it and kind of gives you insights into each participant and, and their motives for wanting to decide on what they decide. For all those of you who gave this up very near the start, again, more fool you. And we're done. That's a huge week for me of comics. Whew. Thank you all for getting through it um, to this point. Um, what are we going to do now? We're going to have a great weekend. I uh, hope you've enjoyed all the books that you've picked up this week. Had as much good time as I did. If you are new here and you've liked it, you've got to this point, you must have liked most of it, surely. Um, and you don't want to miss any more, hit the subscribe button. Um, you won't miss out on Question of the Week. You won't miss out on my pull list video. And you never know, once in a while, I might drop in a surprise video you might miss out on it so hit the subscribe button hit the like give it a big thumbs up and um, any comments down in the um, section below most welcome and I'll do my best to reply to um, whatever you want to put there as long as it's nice have a great weekend everyone take care bye bye